Uh, good afternoon, and uh, today's session is, is on uh, legal methods, um, and my name is Shazia Khan. Today we'll be looking at learning outcome two, which is to understand the principles of legal interpretation. Firstly, what I'd like to do is summarise what we did last, last week, which was learning outcome one. We looked at the um, understanding the sources of law. We looked at how to cite legal cases. Um, we looked at um, how to look at criminal cases. We also looked at the different types of reports that are available, raw re law reports, statutes. We looked at the judicial office in the English legal system. We also looked at the role of the uh, Lord Chief Justice. We looked at the role of uh, the Master of Roles. Um, we also looked at the different sources of um, of law, which were primary and secondary. We also looked at common law and statute, common law and equity. We looked at the types of civil law, tort, contract, company law, family law, and court of protection. We looked at distinguishing between primary legislation and sorry primary secondary and delegated legislation we looked at the types of legislation the hierarchy of the courts so which structure which is the highest court being the supreme court we looked at the impact of the human rights act 1998 and we also looked at what is the european convention on human rights separation of powers in the uk the legislature, judiciary, and uh, the executive, and what their role is uh, as they're working together in di uh, as different organs of the state. We also uh, looked at, at um, how these uh, different organs work together and whether there was uh, an issue of uh, a bias, um, and the we looked at the issue of check some balances within the UK. So now we're going to go on to looking at learning outcome two, which is to understand the principles of legal interpretation. So a recap. Um, so types of law, we have law, which is natural and positive law, which is political. Then we have natural or municipal law international law, constitutional law, ordinary law, which is common law, public, private, administrative, general, statute law, ordinance, case law, and common law. Hello? Hello. Hi, are you, have you come on? No, I, I had a hard time joining the, the meeting. Okay. So, so what we'll do is we just, um, I just went through what we looked at, a recap of uh, last week, which we looked at the different types of um, sources of UK law. And um, now we're going to look at the different types of law and we're going to look at learning outcome uh, two, which is to understand the principles of legal interpretation. It's a little bit of a recap. So the different types of law we have are natural law, positive law, uh, national law, international law, constitutional, ordinary law, which is common law, public and private, administrative, general, statute, ordinance, case law, co common law. There's types of law, we've got constitutional law, which is based on the constitution itself. We've got statutory law, which is enacted by the legislative bodies, administrative law, which is rules and regulations by made by the administrative agencies and civil law, which addresses the wrongs done to individuals. Okay. Then we've got criminal law, which is addresses the wrongs done to society. Procedural law, which deals with methods of enforcing legal rights and duties. Substantive law, which defines the legal rights and duties. And then business law, which looks at business situations and transactions. So then we've got the hierarchy of the court, which we looked at a little bit last week as well, but it's important to identify the highest court. Now we've got the at the top, so we'll start off at the bottom. We've got the magistrate's court, and this is for most uh, criminal offences, some civil matters. There's a magistrate's, a district judge, and a magistrate's court deputy. Um, and then we've got the county court, 
trial for more civil cases, circuit judges and recorders, district judges, deputy district judges, and then the family court. It's a trial for most family cases, at high court judges, circuit judges, recorders, district judges, deputy district judges and magistrates. The reason uh, the family court is separate is because it's uh, to do with more, you know, delicate situations and it's to do with children. Okay. Uh, then we've got like the Crown Court. Um, again, jury trial for indictable and some either way criminal offences, appeals against conviction and sentence from the magistrates court. So there's a circuit judges and recorders and the jury. We have the High Court, which is the Chancery, Queen's Bench and Family Division. All three divisions here appeals from other courts as well as first instance cases. So High Court and Deputy High Court judges. Then we have the Court of Appeal, which is an appeal only on points of law um, to either the criminal or civil division. Lord Chief Justice deals with that and heads of division and Court of Appeal judges. And then the highest court, which is the Supreme Court, is appeal only on points of law and the justices of the Supreme Court. We have the Employment Appeal Tribunal, which deals with appeals from employment tribu tribunals, um, and it will be employment appeal judges and members. Then we have the Employment Tribunal England, Wales and Scotland, claims about matters to do with employment, employment judges and members, upper tribunal appeals from the first tier, and then the first tier appeals tribunal, tribunal judges. And there's a number of tribunals outside, for example, you could have like things like the education tribunal you can have where children have been excluded from school so you could have different types of tribunals but the whole point of the tribunals is that it is a specialist like the employment law tribunal will be a specialist on that matter which okay. is uh, things like discrimination or if someone's disabled you've uh, you you know um unfairly dismiss them constructive dismissal so that will look at things like that the tribunals chart Okay, the first tri uh, first tier tribunal will start there. It'll have things like war, pensions and armed forces compensation chamber, social entitlement chamber, health, education and social care chamber, general regulatory chamber, uh, the tax chamber, immigration and asylum chamber, property chamber, employment tribunal and employment tribunals. The reason we've got these uh, tribunals in place in specialist areas is because they'll deal with things like, uh, the health one will deal with mental health cases, primary health cases, whereas the social entitlement chamber will deal with asylum support, anything to do with social security. So why do you think it's so important to have these specialist tribunals, first tier tribunals? To, to be able to deal with the different cases, right? Yeah. Individually. Yeah, and, and you will be a specialist in that area, so you will have more of an idea. Yeah. Um, so then it goes to the upper tribunal, which deals with administrative appeals tribunal, um, the tax and chancery tribunal, immigration and asylum chamber, um, the lands chamber, and then it goes to the court of appeal, which is court of session and uh, where the appeals are heard. But there's a need for these uh, tribunals in place because the specialist areas, you know, some people may not know about the, comp uh, the you know, uh, mental health side of it or the education side of it. So you need to have a specialist in that area. Key mm -hmm. terminology, what is status decisis? So staris decisis is Latin for to stand by things decided. In short, it is the doctrine of precedent, court site to stare decisis when an issue has been previously brought to court and a ruling already issued. The legal principle of determining uh, points in litigation according to precedent. What is the difference between precedent and stare decisis? The past decisions are known as precedent. So that's past cases. You know, okay. if a case is decided here, historically then it's known as a precedent precedent is a legal principle or rule that is created by the court decision this decision becomes an example or authority for judges to decide on similar cases later so for example if there's a case that's similar previously years ago if there's a case similar to a case today the courts will rely on that case to help them make a decision okay and if the case is similar then it helps the court quite a lot and judges to make that decision. Stare decisis, this is doc doctrine that obligates courts 
to look at precedent when making their decision. The decision or judgment of a judge may fall into two parts. The ratio decidendi, which is reason for the decision, and obiter dictum, which is something said by way. What is ratio decidendi? The rule of law on which um, a judicial decision is based. When a judge delivers judgment in a case, he outlines the facts, which he finds have been proved on the evidence. Then he applies the law to those facts and arrives at a decision for which he gives the reason, which is ratio decidendi. So, uh, you know, he, he must identify why he's come to that decision. Okay. okay. So, you know, if he wants to, um, if there's a case uh, and, and it's to do with murder, but, you know, um, the, the, the prosecution or the defendant's judge has brought it down to manslaughter, he will identify if he's going to give the person uh, uh, the sentence for murder or manslaughter and why he's arrived at that decision. Okay. What is obiter dictum? A judge's expression of opinion uttered in court or in a written judgment, but not essential to the decision and therefore not legally binding as a precedent. It refers to a judge's comments or observations in passing on a matter arising in a case before him, which does not require a decision. So anything that he has uh, an opinion or a comment on, on passing in a decision in a case, he's able to do that. What is Per ecurium. Per ecurium literally translated as, as through lack of care, is a device within the common law system of judicial precedent. A finding of per ecurium means that a previous court judgment has failed to pay attention to relevant statutory provisions or precedents. So, you know, the judge can take that into account that the previous uh, decision that was made, uh, they didn't take uh, any sort of um, uh, relevance to any sort of statute or any sort of previous cases. Oh. 2.1. Explain the doctrine of judicial precedent. The doctrine of judicial precedent involves an application of the principle of stare decisis, to stand by decided. In practice, this means that the inferior courts are bound to apply the legal, legal principles set by the superior courts in earlier cases. This provides consistency and predictability in the law. So what do they mean by the inferior courts? Mm, I have no idea. <laughs> inferior courts mean the lower courts. So what they mean that the, the lower courts are bound by what the higher courts have said. Okay. okay. So which decision is more important, the lower courts or the higher courts? Uh, the most important decisions made are the decisions made in the high courts. High courts, yes, yes. So it provides consistency and predictability in the law. Judicial precedent means the process whereby judges follow previous decided cases where the facts are of sufficient similarity. So, for example, you know, if there's a case on theft and there was a previous case on theft, which will help the judge make the decision, which was very similar, then the judges will follow that. Do you think that's a good thing? Yeah, I think that's a good thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a good thing to refer to the previous cases, yes. Yes, because it gives you a little bit of uh, an idea of what, you know, the decision was then. The decision. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it also gives you guidance on the sentencing as well. Okay. So this, again, is the hierarchy of the courts, which we're not going to go through because I've just been through that earlier on. Um, the European Court of Justice. So under section three, subsection one of the European Communities Act 1972, our decisions of the European Court of Justice are binding in matters of community law on all courts up to, the, up to and including the House of Lords. So at the moment, because we're not part of uh, uh, Brexit, then uh, no longer with the European Court of Justice applying certain cases. The House of Lords, this is the highest court in the land unless a matter of EC law is involved. The House of Lords was bound by its own previous decisions until 1966 when Lord Gardner announced a change of practice, which was called the Practice Statement 1966, which stated that although the House of Lords would treat its decisions as normally binding, it would depart from these when it appeared right to do so. The power has been used sparingly. A decision of the House of Law binds all lower courts. 
okay. the court of appeal civil dishes decision civil division the court of appeal is bound by decisions of the house of lords even if it considers them to be wrong because it's a higher court do you understand so you know they, they are bound by them in you in the case of young and Bristol airplane company limited 1944 the Court of Appeal held that it was bound by its own previous decisions subject to the following three exceptions. Where its own decisions conflict the Court of Appeal must decide which to follow and which to reject. The Court of Appeal must refuse to follow a decision of its own which cannot stand with the decision of the House of Lords, even though its decision has not been expressly overruled by the House of Lords. The Court of Appeal need not follow a decision of its own if satisfied that it has it was given per curiam literally by carelessness or mistake. Decisions of the Court of Appeal itself are binding on the High Court and the County Courts. Court of Appeal Criminal Division. In principle, there is no difference in the application of stare decisis in the civil and criminal divisions of the Court of Appeal. In Practice, however, in addition to the young exceptions, because a person's liability may be at stake, precedent is not followed as rigidly in criminal cases. In the criminal division, in the case of Aaron Taylor, 1950 to QB 368, the Court of Appeal held that in question, questions involving the liberty of the subject, if a full court considered that the law was either being mis misapplied or misunderstood, then it must reconsider the earlier decision. So, you know, it needs to uh, be fair as well. You know, if anything's been misapplied or misunderstood, it needs to be reconsidered. Okay. And I think that's fair in cases, you know, if something, sometimes cases, you know, people feel that they're not fair, they have the right of appeal. Yeah. Um, the High Court. The High Court is bound by the Court of Appeal and the House of Lords, but it's not bound by other High Court decisions. However, they are wrong. There are strong persuasive authority in the High Court are usually followed. Decisions of individual High Court judges are binding on the county courts. A divisional court is bound by the House of Lords and the Court of Appeal and normally follows a previous decision of other divisional courts but may not depart from it if it believes that the previous decision was wrong. And that was the case in the R and Great Manchester Coroner ex parte Tal 1985. Crown Courts. Decisions made on points of law by judges sitting at the Crown Court are not binding, though they are persuasive authority. Therefore, there is no obligation on other Crown Court judges to follow them. County courts and magistrates courts. The decisions of these courts are not binding. They're rarely important in law and not usually reported in law reports. So things like, you know, like if you've got um, a traffic case, you know, like um, driving without insurance or any points. So these, these are not reported because they are minor cases. They are not extreme cases. Okay. So these ones are things like, you know, if you've, if you, You've pinched a, a bar of chocolate from uh, because you are homeless yeah. or anything like that. You know, these kind of small minor yeah. cases or small minor theft cases. 2.2, you distinguish between binding, non-binding and persuasive decisions. The difference between binding and persuasive precedent. Number one, it binds judges that make future decision. Binding precedent must be followed. Persuasive precedent may be influential with a judge, but may be disregarded. So it doesn't have to be but followed. Binding or persuasive depends on the place of the court which made the decision. So whichever court it was in the hierarchy. Ratio de sedandi is binding. So it's a legal principle based on material facts of the case. Orbiter dictum is plural dicta. So this is a statement of legal principle based on hypothetical facts, not before the court might be highly persuasive on later courts when these facts come from respected superior judge or court. A binding precedent is decided is a decided case which a court must follow. 
So, you know, if there's previous cases that courts must follow, why do, why do you think a court will follow that decision? Just, um, are you saying why a court should follow a binding? The previous decision, yeah. To keep track of how the law has been moderated across the years. Yeah. <laughs> to keep track of the law, to keep track of whether, you know, we're implementing the right sentencing guidelines and things like that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but a previous case is only binding in a later case if the legal principle involved is the same and the facts are similar. Distinguishing a case on its facts or on the point of law involved is a device used by judges, usually in order to avoid the consequences of an earlier inconvenient decision, which is in strict practice binding on them. So they need to look at if there's any sort of cases and sort of principles or any sort of uh, you know facts of the case that are similar to the case that is uh, going on now. Now, so you know, they need it has to be later cases. Okay. Overruling a higher court can overrule a decision made in an earlier case by a lower court. The Court of Appeal can overrule an earlier decision. What do you think overruling means? To disregard. disregard. Do you think that's good though? Do you think that's a good thing to have? Well, if a um, if a law doesn't work in a particular situation, it's it's okay yeah. to to overrule. <laughs> yeah, to overrule it. But sometimes yeah. it may work. You know, there may be, you know, there may be no point of overruling it. But so, but they do have the authority to do that. Okay. Overruling can occur if the previous court did not correctly apply the law so if the previous the high court didn't apply the law correctly to a case of murder or manslaughter the court of appeal can overrule that decision and and if the high court didn't take you know apply the law correctly but didn't take any evidence into account as well well or because the later court considers that the rule of law contained in the previous ratio de standard is no longer desirable reverse it Reversing is the overturning of an appeal by a higher court of the decision of the court below that hearing uh, the appeal. The appeal court will then substitute its own de decision. So, you know, uh, you know, the appeal court, will they have to identify why they've changed the decision? Okay. Do you think that they have to do that? Yes, I think they, they have, have to. to explain, yeah, they have to explain why they've done it. Yes, yes. Yeah, because they can't they can't just change decisions like that. Yeah. Um, per incurium, a decision which is reached reached by per incurium is one reached by carelessness or mistake and can be avoided. In Morale and Wakeling, nineteen fifty five two QB three seven nine, Lord Evershed, um stated that the only reason in which decisions should be held to have been given per incurium are those of decisions given in ignorance or forgetfulness or some inconsistent statutory provision or of some authority binding on the court concerned. However, this rule does not permit the Court of Appeal to ignore decisions of the House of Lord. Persuasive presidents. A persuasive president is um, one which is not absolutely binding on a court, but which may be applied. The following are some examples. Decisions of English courts lower in the hierarchy. For example, the House of Lords may follow a court of appeal decision and the court of appeal may follow a high court decision, although not strictly bound to do so. So they don't have to, but they may follow it, okay? Decisions of Judicial Committee of the Privy Council, decisions of the courts in Scotland, Ireland, the Commonwealth, especially Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and the USA, they are usually cited where there's shortage or lack of English authority on a point of law. So, you know, we could use uh, decisions from other countries as well if there's a lack of um, uh, cases that will help us towards getting to, uh, you know, a decision. 
and okay. arbiter dictator of English judges. And that's quite good that we're allowed to look at other courts and cite other cases, you know, um, to identify that, you know, there's an, uh, uh, um, some sort of authority at that point in this, this case, if there's nothing, this, it, it, if there's no case that is similar to an English case. Advantages and disadvantages of Preston. There's certainly, uh, so some of the advantages are there's certainty in the law. By looking at existing precedents, it is possible to forecast what a decision will be and plan accordingly. There's uniformity in the law. Similar cases can be treated in the same way, which is fair. This is important to give the system a sense of justice and to make the system acceptable to the public. Judicial precedent is flexible, so there are a number of ways to avoid precedents, and this enables the system to change and to adapt to new situations. Judicial precedent is practical in nature, so it is based on real life facts, unlike legislation, and judicial precedent is detailed. There's a wealth of cases to which to refer. Some of the disadvantages are that its difficulties can arise in deciding what the ratio decedendi is, particularly if there are a number of reasons. There may be a considerable wait for a case to come to court for a point of law to be decided. Cases can easily be distinguished on their facts to avoid following an inconvenient precedent. And there is um, far too much case law and it is too complex. So see, there's advantages and disadvantages of um, uh, uh, the precedent as well. 2.3, illustrate the operation of literal, golden and persuasive per purpose faced rules of statutory interpretation. The member, the number of rules developed by the courts to assist with interpretation of a statute. These are the literal rule, the golden rule, the mischief rule, the purposive approach. These rules are each take different approaches to interpretation of a statute. Some judges prefer one rule, some judges prefer others. Some judges also feel that their role is to fill the gaps and ambiguities in the law, whilst others think that it should be left to parliament as the supreme <coughs> lawmaking body. As the rule rules can result in uh, very different decisions, it is important to understand each of them and how they may be used. So sometimes, you know, judges have their own perception of, you know, that we need to fill in the gaps, but some it's the, the, the main supreme making lawmaking body is parliament. So in my opinion, I think it should be left to parliament to make that decision, not judges. You know, the judges should follow and interpret the law, not to fill in the gaps, but sometimes they like to fill in gaps. And um, and personally, I think it should be left up to Parliament. And so we've got the first one is the literal rule. Under this rule, the judge considers what the statute actually says, rather than what it meant it might mean. In order to achieve this, the judge will give the words the statute a literal meaning. That is, they plan ordinary everyday meaning, even if the effect of this is to produce what might be considered as an otherwise unjust or undesirable outcome. So, you know, the outcome might not be fair, but the judge is using the words as they are said. Do you understand? So the yeah. literal, they, they don't move away from that. And that's a bit sad, really, because a person may be sentenced wrongfully if you use the literal rule. OK, yeah. the literal rule says that the intention of Parliament is best found in the ordinary and natural meaning of the words used. As the legislative democratic part of the state, Parliament must be, um, must be ta uh, taken to want to affect exactly what it says in the law. If judges are permitted to give an obvious or non-literal meaning to the words of parliamentary law, then the will of Parliament and thereby the people is being contradicted. Lord Diplock once noted, where the meaning of statutory words is plain and unambiguous, unambiguous, it is not then for the judges to invent fancied ambiguities as an excuse for failing to give effect to its plain meaning because they consider the consequences for doing so would be inexpedient or unjust or immoral. So there's advantages and disadvantages of the literature 
electoral rule as well because what Lord Diplock is saying we must follow that we must not judges shouldn't invent you know their own words do you understand we yeah. must follow the words of parliament and and there's advantages and disadvantages for both that then we've got the golden rule this rule is a modification of the literal rule it states that if the literal rule produces absurdity then the court should look for another meaning of the words to avoid that absurd yes. result. The rule was closely defined by Lord Wensaldale in Gray and Pearson, 1857, who stated that the grammatical and ordinary sense of the words is to be ad uh, adhered to unless that would lead to some abs absurdity or some repudiance or inconsistency with the rest of the instrument in which the case the grammatical and ordinary sense of the words may be modified so as to avoid the absurdity and inconsistency but no farther the golden rule provides no clear means to test the existence or extent of any absurdity it seems to depend on the result of each individual case whilst the golden rule has the advantage of avoiding absurdity it therefore has the disadvantage that no test exists to determine what is absurdity. What do you think of the golden rule? Well, I think the golden rule is just, um, it's just used when the literal rule is, is absurd. Yeah, so do you think it's better to use the golden rule? Yes, I think it's better to use the golden rule instead of being too strict with yeah. what the statute says. Yeah, it's the golden rule. The, the, the principle is described, the golden rule is described as putting yourself in someone else's shoe. Yes, okay. So it's, it's literally a way of, uh, you know, trying to kind of look around the best rule that judges use. Then we've got the third rule, which is the mischief rule. This third rule gives a judge more discretion than either the literal or the golden rule. Uh, this rule requires the court to look to what the law was before the statute was passed in order to discover what gap or mischief the statute was intended to cover. Okay. The court is, so it kind of looks at the law before. Yeah. So it, it doesn't look at the law now. So it, it kind of is quite good in a way. Um, so the court is then required to interpret the statute in such a way to ensure that gap is covered. Okay. okay. The rule is contained in Hayden's case 1584, where it said that the true interpretation of a statute, the four things had to be considered. Firstly, what was the common law before the making of the act? Secondly, what was the mischief and defect for which common law did not provide? Okay. Thirdly, what remedy Parliament have resolved and appointed to cure the disease of Commonwealth? And four, the true reason of the remedy and then the office of the judges to make such construction as shall suppress the mischief and advance this remedy. This rule gives the courts justification for going behind the actual wording of the statute in order to consider the problem that the particular statute was aimed at remedying. At one level, it is clearly the most flexible rule of interpretation, but it is limited to using previous common law to determine what mischief the act in question was designed to remedy. The case itself concerned a dispute about legislation passed under Henry VIII in 1540 and a legal action against Hayden for intruding into certain lands in the county of Durham. The rule gives... Uh, the rule gives judge uh, a judge more discretion than either the literal and the golden rules the rule requires the court to look at the law uh, before but also uh, when applying the law the courts will consider the law prior to the legislation uh, there are also some advantages of the um the mischief rule um, the mischief rule can be used to adapt the meaning of a statute to changing circumstances ensuring that the statute continue to serve its intended person. So do you think purpose? So do you think as, as times are changing, um, then statute needs to change as well? Yes, of course, because society changes. Yes, yes. Um, so an example of uh, um, 
this would be um what do you think the mischief rule is uh, quite flexible yeah in the sense that it it, it filled the gaps <laughs> yeah 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 uh, it can this rule can be quite flexible and quite sensible in producing decisions where technological or sociological developments have overtake the original wording used in the act so as society changes you know th th it needs to be taken into account and uh, the purposive approach this approach has emerged in more recent times here the court uh, is not just looking at to see what the gap was in the old law um, it is making decisions to what they felt parliament meant to achieve okay so they're not just looking at filling in the gaps but what parliament intended to achieve um and also um the purposive approach to interpreting legislation looks beyond the words of legislation and at the purpose behind it and the legislation as it's the skeleton of the law for the judges to flesh out um and it's the purposive approach had to be used when deciding on eu matters as well um and there are some advantages the purposive approach leads to justice being done in more individual cases uh, as it has a broad approach it allows the law to cover more approaches than simply a applying the words literally lord denning in the case of um uh, the Court of Appeal stated in Margo and St. Mellon's Rural District Council uh, against Newport Corporation 1950, he identified three key points. First one, we sit here to find out, in, out the intention of Parliament and of ministers and carry it out. And we do this better by filling in the gaps and making sense of the enactment by opening it up to destructive analysis. Secondly, he said that this attitude was criticised on appeal by the House of Lords. Lord Simons called this approach a naked assertion of the legislative function under the thin disguise of interpretation. He went on to say that if a gap is disclosed, the remedy lies in an amending act. Then these comments highlighted one issue with the purposive approach, how Parliament's intention can be determined and whether judges should really be refusing to follow the clear words of parliament. The purposive approach is one used by most continental European countries when interpreting their own legislation. It is also an approach which is taken by the European Court of Justice in interpreting EU law. Since the United Kingdom became a member of the European Economic Community in 1973, the influence of the European preference for the purposive approach has affected the English courts in a number of ways. First, the courts um, have been required to accept that from 1973, the purposive approach has to be used when deciding on EU cases. Uh, second, as they use the purposive approach for EU law, they are becoming customised to using it and more likely to use it to interpret domestic law. One example is the Pickstone and Freeman's PLC 1998 case. Here, woman warehouse operators were paid the same as male warehouse operators. However, Miss Pickstone claimed that the work of the warehouse operators was of equal value to that done by male warehouse checkers who were paid £1.22 per week more than, than they were. The employers argued that a woman warehouse operator was employed on like work to the male warehouse operators, so she could not bring an action under Section 1, Subsection 2C of the 1970 Statute for Work for Equal Value. This was a literal interpretation of the 1970 statute. The House of Lords decided that the literal approach would have left the UK in a breach of its treaty obligations to give effect on EU directive. It is therefore used, it therefore used the purposive approach and stated that Miss Pickstone was entitled to claim on the basis of work of equal value, even though there was a male employee doing the same work as her. When using one of the rules of statutory interpretation, the courts may rely on a presumption or a secondary aids to assist them in making these decisions. Presumptions. When determining the meaning of a particular words, the courts will make certain presumptions about the law. If the statute clearly states that the 
the opposite then a presumption will not apply and it is said that the presumption is rebutted the main presumptions are number one a presumption against a change in the common law. So it's assumed that common law will apply unless parliament has made it plain in the act that common law has been altered. Number two, a presumption that mens rea, which is the guilty mind, is required in criminal cases. So mens rea is one of the elements that has to be proved for a successful criminal prosecution. There's a common law rule that no one can be convicted of a crime unless it's shown that they had the required intention to commit the crime, which is fair because, you know, you need to be able to identify that this person has the intention. Okay? Yeah. Number, th number three, a presumption that the Crown is not bound by any statute unless the statute expressly says so. And number four, a presumption that a statute does not apply retrospectively no statute will apply to past happenings. Each statute will normally only apply from the day it comes into effect. So previous, they won't take anything previous into account, only the date the statute comes into effect. Okay. okay? So this okay. is, however, presumption and Parliament can choose to pass a statute with retrospective effect. This okay. must, however, be express stated in the statutes, for example, the 1965 War Damage Act and the 1991 War Crimes Act and the 1976 Adoption Act. 2M1, to determine the ratio decedendi and orbiter dictum from a given legal case. You need to uh, research from sites and take up cases to determine whether there's a ratio decedendi or an orbiter dicta. Uh, cases to look at uh, in regards to this are the cases of Donahue and Stevenson. Uh, Stevenson, 1932, otherwise known as the snail in the bottle case, and the case of Vidler and Sasson for ratio decedendi. For orbiter dictum, look at the case of Aaron Hoare and Bannister, 1987, and AMT Futures Limited against Marzalia, Dr. Mia, and Dr. Gunter. Retchev I can I cannot say that German 2015 <laughs> and Van Eiken and Camden London Borough Council uh 2002 and the links are there to look at them as well okay, okay. um maybe for may, did you did you manage to do the homework for this week yeah I, yeah I did some of the homework okay we'll go, we'll have a look at that after how to okay. find the ratio ratio decedendi or orbiter dicta in a case. So how to find a ratio decedenda, you look at the subject, subject outline, reading list or case lid, read the head note, read the whole case, focus on key facts and arguments and dealing with multiple judgments. How to find an orbiter dicta case, note the relevance of an orbiter dicta in future court decisions, realize that orbiter dicta may take different forms, as easy rule of thumb is that orbiter dicta ain't the ratio of previous case law, the facts or orders. Spend some time looking for orbiter dicta when reviewing a case, identifying the holding or ruling in the court opinion, isolate all language in the case, both facts and the law that directly support the rule of the case, consider the remaining language in the case, and its weight may vary depending on whether it's passing comment or a rule-like statement, about how the law would apply to a scenario not found on the facts. So some of the references are here that you could use judicial law teachers, repertoire, the judicial system of England, Wales, structure of courts and tribunal system, tribunals organization, the judiciary website, survive law and WikiHow and ICL. So these are some of the really good websites you can use. Glossary of terms, audit of merit, previous counsel, um, order of merit, what that means um, is a common law recognising distinguished service in the armed forces, science, art, literature for the promotion of culture, PC, which is Premier Council of the United uh, Kingdom, which is um, a formal body of advisors to the sovereign of the UK, is membership mainly comprises of senior politicians who are current or former members of either the House of Commons 
are the House of Lords, Deputy Lieutenant, which is LDL, which is in UK, a Deputy Lieutenant is a Crown appointment and one of several duty deputies to the Lord Ten uh, Lieutenant or a Lieutenancy area, an English ceremonial county, Welsh preserved county, Scottish Lieutenancy area or Northern Irish county borough or county. And then MR is Master of Roles Appreciation Society, explains that it's devotion, uh, to the great judge with a paragraph that begins, Lord Denning has made countless memorable judgments that have eased the pain of law school readings for millions. So have you got any questions on this learning outcome, which is learning outcome two, before we carry on with the um, with the um, uh, seminar questions? Have you got any questions, Jacqueline? No, for now I don't have any okay. questions. You just if you want if you just remember for next time if you need to ask anything okay, okay and can okay. can you see this oh no this is not it let's have a look let me share the other slide which was to do with learning out from one okay to open this um, right can you see these questions Jacqueline. Um, yes, I can see. Okay, so we these were for some of the homework from last week, okay? Yeah. And we were looking at some of the questions, and there's five questions. So the first one um, is, what does R stand for in the case of R and Smith? Uh, Regina, which is now Rex, right? Yeah, Regina, and now is what, sorry? Rex. Yeah, and it's for the Queen, isn't it? yeah it's a it's an abbreviation for the queen but now for the king for the king okay yeah so that's what it means so it's the it's the country against an individual so the uh, regina against smith mm -hmm. so it's against the crown okay so and um, number two who is the head of the chancery division of the high court uh, the chancellor of high court the chancellor just give, give me one one minute Okay. I right, saw, so, uh, did you get the, f the f second one? Who's the chancellor of the Division of the High Court, the Chancellor. Is that right? Yeah, the yeah? Chancellor of the High Court, yeah. yeah. What about number three? Who what does the Master of Roles do and which in, in which courts does he sit? Um, the Master of Roles um, he's consulted on matters of civil justice. Um, okay. Yeah, and he's a judge of the Court of Appeal. Yeah. And he's responsible for the deployment and organization of work of judges of the defeat Excellent. of the division, as well as the pres the presiding in one of its court. Um, what yeah. does he deal with? Kind of complex cases. Yes, he cannot. Yeah, he also deals with complex civil cases. Yeah, yeah. Case. Um, he can deal with, with the full range of civil, family, and tribunal matters. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And the position of the law, uh, the master of roles, dates back to at least the 13th century. Okay. So it's quite important. It dates back quite a historical bit. Oh, okay. So explain this case in citation. Oh, what this does that I mean? didn't do. It. <laughs> this so the last... date, it'd be the date first. Yeah. And then the. Uh, EWCA stands for England and Wales Court of Appeal. Yeah, Wales Court of Appeal, okay. Mm -hmm. So that's the date, then it stands oh. for England and Wales Court of Appeal. And then we've oh. got the Civil Division, which is okay. CIV. Okay. Civil Division, okay. Okay. Civil Division. Okay. Okay. E EWCA is a stands for England and Wales Court of Appeal, and then Civil Division. And then 106 is the case number that's assigned by the court. Okay, case number. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. 
And then we've got number five, what change did the Constitutional Reform Act 2005 make to the head of judiciary of England and Wales? Head of judiciary, no, 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 no. What change did the constitutional? Did you find out what change the constitutional reform act made? Yeah, the the reform, um, the powers of the reform of the office of the Lord Chancellor, uh, to the Lord Chief Justice of England, Wales, as head yeah. of the judiciary. Yeah. So yes. it was there to a Constitutional Reform Act 2005. It made new, numerous uh, changes to the judiciary of the UK, as well as the role of the Houses of Parliament. The mm. Act um, introduction was it was uh, it changed the role. It reformed the reform was further motivated by legal concerns of the office of the Lord Chancellor. Um, and it changed his role in regards to what he could and couldn't do. Okay. And okay. Uh, yeah, and then after this, I think the um, the Supreme Court Act was uh, introduced. It Supreme, uh, what was it? The Supreme Court was introduced in two thousand and nine. Yeah, to ensure separation of powers. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So um, have you got anything else with this or what we'll do for next week is um, I'll give you, do you know, like, uh, let me just have a look. Um, do you know further up, there was some cases uh, of this one here. Could you do this yeah. as homework? Look at these cases. Okay, to so determine facts, them. Yeah, to determine whether um, mm. whether is, is a ratio decedendi or an orbiter dicta. So it was slide 27. Okay. So we'll go through them next week, okay? Okay, so try and do a little bit on them. What were the facts and what was adopted in the case, and then okay. we'll go through them. Okay, okay, <laughs> okay. Then, have you got any questions? Mm, no, I just I was just wondering because yes. you said that the cases, um, the new laws are applied after the law, the law, the law has been passed, right? No. So if a law has been passed, for example, if the Human Rights Act has been passed in 1998, yeah. uh, anything previously to that would not be part of the Human Rights Act. If someone okay. wanted to say, oh, I want to bring my case into uh, for the Human Rights Act, and their case was in 1995, they couldn't use the Human Rights Act because it wasn't adopted till 1998. Okay, it applies just with the human rights. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. So it's it's it's, it's any is in any statute that comes in anything that comes in later, uh, you can't apply that to, uh, to an earlier case. Okay, okay, okay. And with the rules, like the literal rule, body rule, mischief rule, um, purposive approach. Yeah. How are they applied? Are they applied? With can two or more be applied or just one yes 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 two or more could be applied um at the uh just one minute okay sorry so these the courts they have the purpose this purposive uh mischief and the golden rule but two can be applied but the courts tend to use um, you know, the one that is used more often um, could be the one that suits the case more. Okay. You know, okay. so they, they can be, you know, um, you know, um, they can be applied more uh, in certain ones like the golden and the literal can be applied together. Um, and the, the, the rule requires the court to look at the law before and okay. Uh, the, to discover any sort of gaps in the law, in the mischief rule. So they could be working together. You know what I mean? The rules of in, mis, uh, interpretation could um, work together, not just one rule at a time. Okay. Okay. And what happens if, uh, for instance, the literal rule has been applied to a case, right? Um, yeah. There's been some changes in the law. During the appeal, uh, could there be any changes like it needs, it needs to make sense 
it needs to make sense to apply the it needs to make sense to apply the law where the gaps fill in you know you can't just say that you know a law's come into place and you know it needs to uh it it doesn't apply to it you know it needs to make sense where the law applies okay you but know, so the, if there's any gaps to fill in okay but as you said it doesn't always make sense so in that case that means they use their purposive approach right yeah okay what was that sorry i didn't get that um before to cover the gap okay the, the mischief rule so just i was asking just in case yeah. uh the literal rule was applied in a particular case and yeah. since society changes um during an what appeal they will, no, what they will do is they will apply what they will do is they'll apply what law they feel that applies to the case okay okay and if okay. the case you know if the, there is a law that applies mm -hmm. so they will look at what the case is do okay. you know if if you know if there's a need to apply the mystery rule or the purposive rule or you know the literal rule okay but what if it has already been decided let's say for a particular case yeah. let's say they, they, yeah then they won't change it they won't change it then yeah, and with time, since society changes. No, no, if it, it, but no, they wouldn't though. They can't just change okay. it like that. They have okay. to look at the case, you know. Oh, okay. All right. They have to look at what's happening at that time with the case, you know, rather than, you know, saying that, you know, we could just change it like that. Because if they could just change it like that, then it's not fair on the cases, is it? No, it's not. Yeah, change. so they, they need to bear in mind that they need to, you know, obviously look at uh, how the law applies in each individual case. And each individual case is different. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 Just have a read around the area because it's quite a big area. Have a read around it. Then next week we'll go through the questions, okay? Okay, okay. Thank you very okay. much. Okay, I'll see you next week, Jacqueline. Okay, see you next week. Thank Bye. You. Bye, thank you.